Solar winds swept clean this planet four and a half billion years ago. Earth thrived. Its natural elements helped it to flourish, and its bounty was for all to share. Then a life form of superior intelligence evolved, and for a while lived in harmony with the Earth. But paradise has been put into jeopardy. The motives are irrelevant. The consequences, severe. The remedy is written. The elements of life are clear. In this edition of Elements, mass migration in Western Mongolia. Following a third year of severe drought, thousands of herding families are deserting their traditional lands and migrating towards the cities and richer pasture lands in a desperate bid to survive. Ten years ago, Britain's waterways were branded amongst the dirtiest in the world, but today they're amongst the cleanest. Thanks to a massive financial investment, fish have returned and the waters are noticeably clearer and pollution-free. In an unlikely partnership, a mining company and a university have joined forces to help safeguard the future of koalas living near a major mine in central Queensland. And missing out on the fun of one environment just because you live in another is becoming a thing of the past, especially in Dubai, where you can hit the ski slopes in the middle of a sweltering summer. Turkey's Dalian coast is one of the key nesting beaches for the rare Coretta Coretta's sea turtles. And Istuzu Beach is watched 24 hours a day to protect the precious eggs. Turkish environmental authorities take special measures between the months of May and September to protect the turtles from harm during this delicate period. Workers build walls to help hatchlings make their way to the beach and even erase track marks to prevent predators from following the newborns. A turtle matures by the age of 25 and lays an average of between 60 and 90 eggs each season. She'll lay her eggs 30 to 40 meters up on the beach and 50 to 60 centimeters down under the sand. Two months later, the hatched turtles dig their way to the surface and make their way out to sea. There are 17 important coasts in Turkey, including Dalian, Dalaman, Patara, Anamur, and Samandagi. Under the Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats Treaty, signed in 1982 at the Bern Convention, each of these coastlines is highly protected and regularly surveyed. Here, the whole process is being observed, noted, and monitored by the Special Environment Protection Board 24 hours a day. Statistics are carefully gathered and the turtles are above all protected. These animals, which are believed to have been around since prehistoric time, weigh 70 to 160 kilos and are 90 to 120 centimeters tall. Female turtles somehow know to deposit their eggs at just the right time so that their young come into the world during a bright full moon. This allows the baby turtles to make their way quickly to the relative safety of the sea from around 300 separate nests found scattered along the entire coastline. It's during this critical period that many baby turtles are killed by hungry crabs, jackals and wolves, which is why the workers are always so careful to cover their tracks. Japanese carpenters descended on Tokyo's Senso Temple recently for a traditional festival which culminates in some amazing acrobatics high atop bamboo ladders. 
The festival, which goes back 200 years, starts with a Shinto ritual whereby priests offer rice wine, vegetables and prayers to the souls of carpenters. In times gone by, carpenters would double as firemen when fires broke out in the city. After the solemn ceremony, the carpenters march around the grounds of Senso Temple and Senso Shrine, which lies adjacent to it, carrying banners with the standard of each Tokyo district, while singing Kiyari songs or work tunes, which were once sung to encourage carpenters and construction workers. Then the ladder stunts begin. The bamboo ladders are 6.6 .6 meters high and held upright by half a dozen men using poles. A carpenter in traditional attire scurries up the ladder and goes through a repertoire of acrobatic stunts balancing on the end of the ladder. Some of the more experienced carpenters choose to do their tricks on top of a single pole. Today, the ladder stunts are performed for entertainment, but in the past, they had a practical purpose. Traditional Japanese houses are made primarily of wood with sliding doors and partitions made of paper. A fire in or near a house would usually devastate the entire neighborhood. Carpenters who were used to working in high places, such as on top of houses and building structures, made up a large portion of the neighborhood fire brigade. These makeshift firemen used to climb on top of tall ladders to determine where the fire was and which way the wind was blowing. While modern firefighting techniques have made this antiquated practice redundant, it's been kept alive as a form of entertainment and as a link to the city's colorful past. Today there are around a thousand carpenters in Japan who carry on this unusual acrobatic tradition. The ceremony concludes with some more rousing Kiari work tunes on behalf of all the carpenters who died while putting out the fires or falling from the ladders. In Mongolia's western province of Zarkan, increasing numbers of nomadic herders are embarking on a long and difficult journey. Already 200 kilometers from their home in Ubs province, this group is heading to Ulaanbaatar, a 45-day journey across Mongolia's plains. They're migrating from their traditional lands to escape a third consecutive year of severe drought and hoping to find greener pastures near the capital. In Ubs province alone, drought and severe winters have killed almost half a million head of livestock. Batmonk, a herder whose own flocks dwindled by 70% in recent months, plots his course towards the capital. Fortunately, he has relatives who will help him when he arrives. In Ubs province, some 80% of the land has been hit by drought. A lake in the area is running drastically low. Last year alone, some 6% of the population in Ubs migrated out of the province. The natural disaster has caused such big losses that living in the dry rural areas has become near impossible. The trek across thousands of kilometers of inhospitable land is fraught with difficulties. The government has been forced to set up makeshift tent villages to help provide basic services for families searching for richer pasture land. But there's a growing concern that the food of migrants and the sudden increase of herding families to urban areas will put too much pressure on the cities. While migrating families continue their trek across Mongolia, the future is looking increasingly bleak for both people and cattle, too weak or too old to make the long journey. The genocide in Rwanda in 1994 that left an estimated million dead and many thousands homeless was sparked by environmental problems much like those in Mongolia. A conference held near London recently discussed the role of the environment in sparking conflicts, particularly in the developing world. Deserts are expanding as the planet warms and a billion people now lack access to a safe water supply. Conference delegates all agreed that adopting responsible environmental management policies urgently 
was the only way to avoid increased political tension caused by rampant consumption of water, forests and energy resources. Going for Green is the largest and most successful environmental awareness campaign in Britain to emerge from the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. The Environmental Agency reports an 81% increase over the last 10 years in the number of stretches of river that are now rated as very good. And of the 269 stretches of river rated as bad in 1990, 105 have now been issued with a clean bill of health. While the £30 billion invested by the waterways companies has gone a long way to solving the problem, Going for Green now wants the public to do its bit to keep the water free from rubbish. The environmental organisation estimates the Thames alone could still get another 20 to 30% cleaner. Elsewhere in Britain, some 4,000 miles of waterways were built between 1760 and 1850 but their use for business and pleasure gradually declined as other forms of transport such as the motor car and the aircraft developed. Today the inland waterways are back in a hive of activity. It seems inconceivable that just over 50 years ago almost the entire canal system was under threat of closure. The turnaround has come as government, business and public recognition has grown to capitalize on the potential of this unique environment. There are now thousands of people coming here every day to work, play, shop and enjoy themselves. As a result of pressure from the inland boating industry, British Waterways recently held a three-day inland waterways exhibition. More than 30,000 people visited the display, which was a great way for local boat builders to showcase their craft. The price of canal boats such as these range from 20,000 to more than a hundred thousand pounds. As canal side life, both on and off the water, draws growing consumer interest. Further exhibitions are planned across the country with waterside potential generating a new upmarket image for a cleaner, greener Britain. The use of tools has long been considered the thing that separated man from beast. However, early ornithologists were told by Aboriginal people that the black-breasted buzzard was able to break open emu eggs with a stone. The story couldn't be substantiated until a few years ago when a captive pair was seen to break an egg with a stone thrown from their beaks. This wild black-breasted buzzard visited the Birds of Prey afternoon show at the Territory Wildlife Park in Darwin recently and circled overhead for some time before landing near a replica emu egg. Looking somewhat nervous at first, the bird instinctively headed straight for the stone, picked it up in a beak and began throwing it at the egg until it cracked. This remarkable footage was recorded at the wildlife park by a German tourist during bird trainer David Irwin's daily presentation. The fake hollow egg, although containing small pieces of food as a reward for the performing birds, was obviously not what the wild bird had expected. The only other bird which is reported to use stones to break eggs is the Egyptian vulture. And still in Australia, the Blair Atoll coal mine in central Queensland is home to a small colony of koalas. For the last 10 years, the mine has monitored the koala population with the help of scientists from the University of Queensland. The mine has now agreed to sponsor a research program to ensure the animal's survival. Koalas at the site have been fitted with tracking devices, so researchers can study health, movement and reproduction of the adult mammals and their offspring. Scientists believe that more needs to be known about the ecology of koalas and by studying those resident at the coal mine, it will help pinpoint problems suffered by the species in general. The program will continue for the life of the mine with the hope that the koala population, as well as all other marsupials in the area, will continue to thrive long after the mine is gone. 
A terrified koala chased up a tree by dogs in a suburban backyard is a whole different problem, and one that Australia's only private animal rescuer, Nigel Williamson, relishes. No job is too tough for this self-confessed animal lover, even if it involves a long struggle 10 metres up with a less than cooperative client. But Nigel prides himself on always getting his marsupial. Although not exactly in the league of Hollywood's Ace Ventura pet detective, played by the actor Jim Carrey, Nigel still receives around 30 calls a day. The pet detective's other cases range from strange noises in the wall, which usually turn out to be hungry ringtail possums, wombats in stormwater drains, and magpies trapped inside shopping centres. There's even been an odd request to prevent suicidal goannas from barbecuing themselves on live power lines. Nigel's motto is the more difficult the problem, the better. His challenge comes from resolving the situation and rescuing the animal no matter what. According to Nigel, the job satisfaction is indescribable, but even he wonders how horses often end up in swimming pools. And in the case of heavily outnumbered spiders, it doesn't always seem to be the animal who needs the most rescuing. Nigel's attitude is that no other job on this planet could give you the same buzz. While a financial reward is always appreciated, the feeling you get from saving an animal's life is well and truly reward enough. A group of locals in the Mexican town of Chimalacatlan, some 140 kilometers south of Mexico City, made the discovery of a lifetime in a nearby cave while searching for water. Their find yielded over 40 fossilized bits and pieces, including femurs that measure a meter in length. Preliminary studies suggest that they may have belonged to a mammoth. The residents have taken great pride in their discovery and are protesting the proposed removal of the fossils from their town. They've even taken it upon themselves to guard the remains in their homes, while paleontologists from Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology conduct scientific tests. It's believed that mammoths inhabited various parts of Mexico some 10 million years ago during the Pleistocene age. According to studies, Mexico's central region was home to two species of mammoths, and both were believed to have tipped the scales at five tons and measured a height of over four meters. Colombian mammoths most closely resembled Asian elephants with very little hair, unlike their famous cousin in more northern climates, the woolly mammoth. Researchers hope to determine whether the creatures were killed by experienced paleo-Indian hunters or if they became mired in an ancient swamp and starved to death. At first, the locals didn't care for the ancient bones and even tried to sell them to tourists, but they now understand their historical and cultural importance and hope to establish a museum in their town to ensure the fossils remain there. An equally unusual find was made in Peru recently when a pre-Hispanic mummy, whose date of origin has been estimated between 1200 and 1400 AD, was found by street market vendors. They apparently informed the police that there was a cadaver in their local garbage dump. The local authorities arrived at the dump expecting to find a crime scene, but instead they extracted a mummy, which was wrapped in ancient cloth and transported it to the city morgue. According to the astonished official from the National Institute for Culture who examined the mummy at the morgue, the body is that of a young female, most probably under the age of 18. The cause of her death is still unknown. It's believed that the mummy was dumped by bandits who had pilfered a nearby excavation site when they realized that they couldn't manage to keep it with them. The mummy will be transferred to the Chan Chan Site Museum where it will be studied by archaeologists.
The age of the mummy was determined by analyzing the characteristics and design of the linen cloth that she was wrapped in. Dubai-based Landmark Exhibitions recently opened Snow World, a place where children and adults can enjoy more than 400 tons of snow and ice all year long. Snow World is located in a huge tent-like structure in the middle of Dubai's Creek Park and has already attracted tourists from many Gulf Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia. Outside, a camel takes children for rides in the sweltering heat. While inside, visitors have to wear heavy coats in order to look at massive ice sculptures in sub-zero temperatures. Many visitors have never seen snow before, so the chance to see some here makes the locals feel like they're not missing out on too much abroad. According to Youssef Al Hindi, Vice President of Landmark Exhibitions, the complex is the first of its kind in the Middle East, but judging by its success, it won't be the last. The ski slope, which is 10 meters wide and 45 meters long, cost one and a half million dirhams to construct, the equivalent of 400,000 US dollars and took four months of continuous work to complete. Yusef El Hindi believes the company has challenged nature. While it's 45 degrees plus outside, the temperature on the ski slope is a frigid minus 10. Until now, children in these parts have only read about skiing and snow and even snowmen. But for the first time, they can experience all these things for themselves. And that makes the people involved with the project very proud. Landmark Exhibitions is also planning an even bigger extravaganza in four years' time. A 120 million dirham ski slope, which will be one kilometre long. While the modern day trend to create bigger and better artificial environments is seen as a fun and profitable endeavor, they may someday be a necessity if and when Earth's natural resources are gone. <laughs> 